Bienvenidos and welcome to Inside the UPSL on TVE Max and on TVEmax.com. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and on Instagram. That is at UPSL Soccer. I am your host, Alex Naveja, and alongside with me tonight is Dennis Pope, as we are here every Thursday to bring you guys the latest news on the fastest growing pro development soccer league, the UPSL. As we welcome you all into Off the Top, where we bring in the, the top three latest stories in lower division soccer. For starters, we have the United States Soccer Federation and the Soccer United Market, along with the MLS, agreeing to the training compensation and the solidarity payments. What does this mean for the UPSL, along with any other soccer leagues? So the idea now is that United States Soccer Federation and Major League Soccer are going to conform to the rest of the world standard when it become when it comes down to training compensation and solidarity payments. Those two things. Uh, training compensation means that the teams that or the clubs that t players have played for previously they get compensated as they go from a certain age point. So if a t if a player signs for a big European club, that European club pays shares to each of those previous training clubs. Solidarity payments work a little bit differently. Um, and a little the verb the verbiage on that's a little different, but it's the same concept. Is the teams that you've played for previously get compensated for their training of you? Um, and so Major League Soccer, up into this point, their first 22 years, they've ignored this. Um, it's a FIFA mandate that all professional clubs should have to do this. Uh, but the United States Soccer Federation has danced around this forever, trying to avoid having to pay solidarity payments. But as the league grows and more and more players come up through their academy system, they're beginning to lose those players to Europe and other places and not being able to get compensated back for the work that they've done with those players. And so I think that the thinking has turned a little bit. They're willing to now invest as well as in order to receive you know, those payments in return. Um, what does it mean for the UPSL clubs? Really nothing. This is only a, a United States Soccer Federation MLS agreement. Um, teams and clubs and other leagues like the USL or the NPSL or the UPSL um, aren't really affiliated with any of that. So is this a first step, you know, towards maybe something for those lower division leagues who do cultivate players? Maybe, but as it stands right now, it's just for major league soccer teams and their academies. So nothing positive going on just yet? Not really for the lower division clubs. And that's where this deal has drawn a little bit of criticism. What does it mean for the rest of American soccer? You know, because it's a vast community out there aside from just Major League Soccer. So, you know, what does it mean for a team like Milwaukee Bavarian who brings kids up through their, you know, youth academy and then they move on eventually, you know, play college and do whatever else. Do they now have the opportunity to be compensated? Well, time will tell on that, uh, but it's going to be probably several legal fights to get to that point. Mm -hmm. So some big things happening up as far as the professional soccer and unfortunately things... It's big news. It's big news nationally. It might change the scope of how players are um, trained going forward, but there's no nothing definitive yet for mm -hmm. UPSL clubs yet. No. And moving on, we do have the Florida soccer soldiers who seems to always make their way into the news. They mm -hmm. just managed to get a win one to nothing against the Red Force FC. Do you think how memorable is this matchup going to be for these two? Well, for a regular season match, this was a real classic. Um, it was a Tuesday night special down there in Florida last night at Tropical Park Stadium. Um, and it was, you know, an incredible match to watch. Uh, Red Force had an opportunity to score a goal early. Um, and the let me let me strike that turn it uh, soccer soldiers had an opportunity to score early and the red force keeper came up massive with a couple of saves down in their end um, and, and to, to hold on to the game but soccer soldiers super talented club they found a way um, to get a goal I think it was in the second half um, and sort of you know put the game on its on its head and, and pull away at the end red force had been unbeaten to that point this season. And soccer soldiers, because of qualifying for the U.S. Open Cup and a couple other things, hadn't played very many matches. So this is a significant win for them in the league season. Um, this could mean, you know, the difference going forward between um, finishing in that top spot and, and having to play your way into a playoff or something. So, you know, significant, yes. Um, and I think the scoreline suggests this is going to be um, a, a good rivalry for some time. These are really two of the best teams in Florida, you know, period. Is 
the Florida soccer soldiers going to be a team that you got to really keep an eye out on in Florida. For sure, on. they're they're still going. They got a game in a couple of weeks in the U.S. Open Cup first round, and, and I think they're right there. You know, in, in challenging for the Florida South division again. They were right there last season. I think they lost in the playoff uh, to Miami Sun. So they're always right there. They were a national finalist two seasons ago. So they're definitely a team that you're gonna have to keep your eyeball on. Mm -hmm. So our final news that we got to cover as the Waza Flow joining the UPSL and going to the Detroit's oldest professional soccer club. And they're going to be added to the Midwest, mm -hmm. but their first matchup is going to be against the BIH Grand Rapids this Saturday. Is this going to make them an instant contender in the Midwest? They have a lot of talent, Waza Flow does. They've uh, been an indoor major arena and professional arena soccer league team for some time, about 10 years. I think they came around in 2008 was their founding year. Um, they're owned by the Scaluna brothers. They're a couple of kind of eccentric guys with long red hair, um, they, but they put a fun product out and they've really been able to build the club. Um, they have a youth academy called Waza FC um, that's based in, in, in Michigan, the D Detroit area, but they also have a, a like a satellite in New York, and they also run a couple of academies in Africa. So they're all over the place, and they've built several professional teams now. They got the, the PASL, the MASL2, they have a women's team, and they play in both men's and women's amateur leagues there locally. So they're really a well-rounded club, and like I said, they, they've pr provided a lot of talented players so far for other UPSL teams. Um, recently, in these, in, especially last season, a lot of Waza Flow players ended up playing spring season soccer in the UPSL, but now they're hoping to bring some of that talent back in and, and produce it through Waza Flow and sort of, you know, create their outdoor setup going forward in the UPSL. So now they'll have a, a major arena soccer league team, they'll have a, a UPSL outdoor team, um, and they'll have a full youth academy. So they should be able to, to really round out um, what it means to be a full soccer club there in the Detroit area. Mm -hmm. So this is a really good team that has done an excellent job expanding and mm -hmm. just really trying to go to different parts of the world and really getting, as you said, the youth academies right. and uh, doing that extension. And Detroit's really a hot spot for soccer in the United States right now. Um, Detroit City FC is one of the most notable lower division teams. They play in the MPSL Pro. They'll be in an MPSL Founders Cup team. Um, and so there's a lot of talk about is Detroit maybe an MLS potential site at some point, you know, with this new expansion that they're doing. Uh, that sort of remains to be seen, but Detroit is being thrown around a lot in soccer circles. So to put Waza Flow into the UPSL from Detroit and kind of get that going as a full, like the, the East Division of the Midwest Conference is all Michigan teams now, basically. And so that's a massive step. The UPSL is now sort of taking over the state of Michigan, which before had been sort of um, a Great Plains sort of um, uh, upper Midwest only situation, but now they're really affiliated with the UPSL and, and things are pushing forward for them locally. So having Waza Flow is a big name that should carry some uh, momentum for that division going forward. Mm -hmm. But we're going to go ahead and take our first break. But when we come back, we're going to have Eric Gonzalez from the Las Vegas Lights FC joining us in just a few minutes. And don't forget to follow us on all of our social media platforms. That is Instagram, Facebook, and on Twitter. That is at UPSL Soccer.
Welcome back to Inside the UPSL, presented by TV Emax. And now we'd like to welcome in Eric Gonzalez into the show. Eric, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing very well. I just wanted to thank you guys for you know having me tonight. You know, it's a great honor to be here. Now let's get this started. Well, we appreciate you coming on, Eric, uh, and coming from Las Vegas. But I mean, what's it like playing for a pro team over there in Vegas? Oh, it's it's honestly one of the best best feelings in the world. This is actually my my first professional gig. Um, you know, I have a lot of people to thank for you know getting this opportunity in the first place, and to be here in Vegas and probably if not the, the entertainment capital of the world and being able to play for a professional soccer team there, it's truly an amazing feeling. Um, can't tell you how much uh, I value you, the fans that we even have here. You know, at home games we rever we rever registered eight thousand, nine thousand fans, and you know, coming from an amateur league of maybe getting twenty maybe even 30 fans, you know, we're getting, you know, all, all those numbers of fans. So it's really, you know, amazing feeling to be a part of this uh, Las Vegas Lights team. Eric, this is Dennis Pope, Director of Communications for the UPSL. Um, you were an all-county player in Riverside County growing up, and then you decided to go the college soccer route. Can you tell us a little bit about what your youth soccer days were like? Yeah, um, you know, I, I played for Crony United. Um, I started playing club actually when I was six years old. They didn't really have an age group for my for my age, so I had to play two, sometimes even three years up. And so I played for Crony United up until I was probably about 13. And then from there I went to the LA Galaxy Academy when I was 13, 14. And you know, I was playing with the U.S. Youth National Team from the U14, U15, and U17 age groups. So um, in the U14 and U15 age groups, I was still at the LA Galaxy Academy up until when I got to the U17 youth, uh, men's national team. I had a, an opportunity to move out to the U17 residency program in, in Bradenton, Florida. So I got to live there for a whole year, came back, um, continued playing with the LA Galaxy Academy, won the U16 National Academy Championship, and then from there I, I went to Chios USA. Uh, played my last year of, of uh, academy there, and then from there, I, you know, I was fortunate enough to get a scholarship to UC Riverside. And you played four full seasons at UC Riverside. Yes, that's correct. And what was your choices? What was your path after college? Uh, my path after college, honestly, I, I I wanted to play professionally as soon as I got out. I uh, made some tryouts here and there, but unfortunately, I never got the call back. So I just. Ended up playing in MPSL in uh, with SoCal SC for two seasons, and then from there uh, I went to Cal United. You know, back then they were OC and Vecta. Got to play with a lot of experience and a lot of former professional players there. Won a UPSL national title, and then fortunately enough, I played with Riverside Chorus in MPSL, and from there I went to Cal SC and I got picked up from Cal SC. And what was that process like, uh, going from Cal FC and playing in the U.S. Open Cup qualifiers to then getting the opportunity with Las Vegas Lights? Well, I mean, the opportunity, obviously, the head coach, uh, Keith Kastigan, I've known him since I was 14 when he was uh, assistant coaching my, my LA Galaxy team. And he reached out to me after this past NPSL season when I was playing with Riverside Chorus that Cal FC was going to start again. Uh, he really liked me, you know, to be a part of the team. It's just uh, the only thing was that, you know, Cal, Cal are based in Calabasas. And I was living in Corona, California at the time. So it would be a sacrifice to make the training, the games, all that type of stuff. And I figured, you know, this was going to be a great setup for me, for me to get good games, you know, to get looked at potentially, play Open Cup. So, you know, I made the sacrifice, you know, going to Calabasas for trainings. You know, be training at 8 p.m., so I'd have to leave by like at 5.30, 5 ish, to be traffic, to make trainings, to make games on the weekend. So it was all a sacrifice, but it, it, it worked out. And in one of the Open Cup qualifier games, uh, the head coach for Las Vegas Lights, Eric Wynalda, uh was there at one of the games, and he scouted me and asked me to try out um, for the Las Vegas Lights, which I made the team from there. So what would you say, what role has the UPSL played in your ability to bounce back and, and try pro soccer again? 
the UPSL, it gave me a lot of competitive games. A lot of competitive games. Uh, I was playing with Cal United, Cal SC, you know, two great teams that I was fortunate enough to get good trainings from, get good games. You know, that, that's what I was looking for, honestly, with, with a game. And the UPSL provided us with, with a lot of games. Every weekend I'd be playing. So, that, I mean, UPSL has benefited me a lot. And, and playing for Cal United and winning that national title in this last season, what has that done and what has that meant to your career and your, your professional growth? Well, the thing is, I mean, not many people could say they've won the UPSL national title. So, obviously, adding that to my resume definitely helped. And then, you know, hopefully, you know, making that transition into pro soccer, I had that under my belt. So, you know, it all plays a part, winning that national title. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, uh, is the UPSL the future of soccer in America? I, I believe it is. Because it's a, it's a very fast, expanding uh, league. There's a lot of teams. You know, I get the notifications of how many teams are you know, starting to form and all over and all over the United States. Like, you know, I get a notification that there are teams in Alaska. I didn't even, I didn't even know this. So, you know, it's great to see that soccer is being built. And, you know, it, it all has to um, do with, uh, with UPSL. UPSL provides all these, you know, great games, has all of these teams that are looking to compete. And the fact that UPSL has uh, promotion and relegation, I think that's a, you know, definitely a great idea to have as well in your league. Yeah, it's like every day that our guy Dennis Pope is reporting on new teams coming in almost on a daily basis and the UPSL developing every day. But I know the llamas are getting pretty crazy over there in Las Vegas. Have you gotten a photo shoot or anything going on yet? No, not yet. <laughs> but is it in the, are you going to put it in the planner? Are you going to make that happen at all? Uh, I'm not sure yet. I'm just, you know, going day to day, uh, living you know, professional career, I got to make sure that this, this is my first priority and, you know, I got to make sure I, I got to do what I can to, you know, help this team. Mm -hmm. Well, Eric, thank you so much for your time today. We appreciate you stopping by. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you for coming by. And that was Eric Gonzalez. As We're going to go ahead and step aside and hear from our sponsors. Mr. John manages a small football club with just a few followers. Every day he wonders, how can I attract more supporters? Internet is the answer, but a channel is time consuming, expensive, and hard to maintain. Everything has changed since Mr. John met Mike Ujo, the football broadcasting solution for small and medium-sized clubs and leagues. Mr. John noticed how everything has started to change quickly when supporters and fans began to arrive. If you want your club to enjoy the same benefits as Mr. John's, sign up with MyCujo.tv. Attract more followers for your club and empower its business now. MyCujo, democratization of football broadcasting. MyCujo.tv Welcome back to Inside the UPSL, presented by TV Emacs. Here is the UPSL's Goals of the Week, presented by The Right Stuff.
And those are the UPSL goals of the week. A lot to choose from. Dennis, I'm having a hard time even just trying to pick one. All four of those are great goals to shoot from. Yeah, for the first week, that's a fantastic batch to pick from. I think the fans are really um, in luck this week with the choices. Uh, some really, really cracking goals. Two free kick goals. Uh, the, the goal from uh, Point, Port St. Lucie United's. Uh, Ryan Jamai was a, a miraculous goal, and then the lion side goal to hit it one time left footed on the volley is just as sweet as it gets. So, yeah, take your pick. Which one do you guys like the best? Um, when's the poll end? The poll will end tonight at 11.59 p.m., so don't forget to vote because they're coming in pretty hot, I would say, and a lot of good choices here tonight, but I mean, if I had to choose and if I had an opportunity to vote, I would pick the Port St. Lucie's United goal. That mm. was very, very good right there. Yep. Off balance, he's falling back and ends up getting a nice kick off and ends up making a goal yeah. right there. That's that's tough. Yeah, that's Ryan Jamai, Port St. Lucie, that fantastic goal. Uh, Michael Reyes' goal for Innocentes on the free kick was nice. Uh, Ricardo Velasquez, the San Juan at the top of the box, that free kick was upper 90. And then the, the Lions side goal by Jacob Gill, uh, like I said, left footed, first touch, volley. Um, they all super goals. Uh, and and the, we can't thank the right stuff enough for, for presenting this and, and sponsoring the Goal of the Week promotion again. So really cool. Uh, make, get your picks in. And definitely some very good choices and going to be pretty tough to choose. But, I mean, nothing to take away from those free kicks. Definitely very tough kicks there. And being able to go around the defense right mm -hmm. then and there, some tough shots right there for those players, right? Yep, yep. And, and you, know, you, you like the, the Port St. Lucie goal. I, I think... If I was to, to be as partisan as possible and not do my job, um, I would like to see a, a kick on the run of play, you know, so I might lean toward the Lions side goal. I might lean that way, but, um, you know, I think any of those goals is deserving of the winner. I think currently there's uh, more than 300 votes and the Port St. Lucie goal is leading, so it has a good chance. So the people have already spoken on the Port St. Lucie shot right then and there. Don't forget to get your polls in again and your votes. The voting will end tonight at 11.59 p.m. Make sure to get all of your votes in and you can vote on Twitter. Just follow us on at UPSL Soccer and we're going to take another break. But when we come back, it'll be time for us to swing our way to the UPSL East Coast Swing. Welcome back to Inside the UPSL, presented by TV Emacs. It's time to make our way to the East Coast Swing as we talk about the pressing topics across the UPSL East. First stop, we have Florida as the PSL United got the Inside the UPSL push with more than 2K views. How big is this with that many views? I think that's astonishing, you know, to get that sort of number for a regular season game this early in the season. To pull in 2,500 viewers or whatever their total was, 2,460 or 20, what is it, 2,340? I'm <laughs> just guessing at this point. But uh, still, a fantastic number, and I think that is the, the regular season record to this point. Um, the championship game, the last fall season, brought in, I think they had 5K viewers for the championship game, something like that number. So it's not the all-time record for UPSL views on Mike Cujo, but it is a significant number. Um, and it's, it's their record to date this season, and they've just continued to steadily grow. They've had a couple of, uh, like, 1,200s, 1,400s, and now they're peaking over to two grand. It's like, what is PSL United doing? Are they offering freebies for people that watch Mike Cujo? How are they bringing in these numbers that nobody else can bring? So everybody else is around, you know, 500 total views, it seems like. People are growing, but they're like, you know, they're another exponential level above what people were pulling in on Mike Cujo. So we're just wondering, PSL, what are you guys doing? What's going on down there? You got to spill this, spill the beans on us, please. And, you know, earlier you were guessing numbers. 2615, yeah. uh, 2719. I, I was just guessing numbers, too. <laughs> just, you were doing that earlier, too. So I just wanted to guess some numbers as well, too. But uh, moving on, uh, we're going to go ahead and make our way over to the southeast. And the Del Sol FC quietly off to a 4-0-0 record mm -hmm. in Mid-Atlantic South A Division. What has worked so well for the squad? 
Well, clearly, you know, they're clicking. I, I think they're, they're plus six in goal differential. I think they've scored nine goals in four matches so far. So they're getting a, a consistent offensive output. Uh, and, but they've gone under the radar there in the Mid-Atlantic, um, you know, with teams like Low Country United and Savannah in, in, a, in a rivalry match coming up this weekend, kind of stealing a little bit of the spotlight. Um, and then also on the, the north end of the Mid-Atlantic with world-class premier in Baltimore United and that new rivalry kind of taking up some of the spotlight. So Del Sol off to a great start so far. Um, undefeated 4-0-0 like you said. I think, you know, if they can keep pushing, you know, they're going to make some noise come to the playoffs and probably some pr surprise some more people. You know, the old saying goes, work in silence and success will be as loud as possible. I think I bombed that. But, yeah, yeah. but I, it's a metaphor. But you, you know what I'm trying to say, right? All right, well, uh, we're going to shift our way over to the Atlantic Caribbean as a non-league America has announced the division as its newest dock focus. What are your thoughts on this new announcement? Well, non-league America is a UPSL media partner. Um, they've been covering lower division soccer now for several years, and now in the last two years, they've begun creating documentaries like full-fledged documentaries about some of these clubs in lower division soccer. And so now they've announced that their next focus is going to be the Atlantic Caribbean division, which I think is fantastic. There's so many great stories coming out there. The league itself is 20-ish years old, and so they're now in just their second season in UPSL, but they have a long history there in the Atlanta area, and the, the league is created by you know Jamaicans and Haitians and all these people from the Caribbean, Dominicans and so on and so forth. Um, you know, it ha has built really something special there in Atlanta. I think, you know, the non-league documentary is really going to show that. So we're excited to see that. We are, uh, you know, pl very pleased and privileged that non-league America has chosen this as a documentary focus. And I think it's going to really help promote um, the UPSL's uh, diversity nationwide and showing, you know, what the UPSL is about, how the UPSL can come in and affect change in places where soccer has been but has sort of uh, languished, you know, locally. It, bringing in the UPSL has given the Atlantic Caribbean division new life. And so hopefully the Non-League America documentary will show that. So would this be something like an E60 type of deal where it's just like the, where ESPN has their mm -hmm. documentaries? Um, you know, Jamissa, she's the, the videographer and the director of these things. Um, she t has her own style, certainly, um, and I wouldn't really compare it to an ESPN 30 for 30 or anything like that, but she does bring in the interviews, she does show the highlights and packages it all, you know, very nicely together, so it will be a very entertaining product, uh, you know, and I think it, it'll have its own style and it'll reflect the Atlantic Caribbean division for sure. Mm -hmm. We'll have to look out for that documentary because I'm already pumped to watch yeah, it. Yeah, it's it going to be a good one. Looking like some good stuff going over there in the Atlantic Caribbean. And now over to the Northeast. Please, Dennis, tell me, what is going on with the two tiers right now? Is it still a work in progress or what's going on? Maybe a little bit. I know that the, the Pro Premier tier has begun play already. And so I think they're pretty locked in to the group of teams that they have going on there. Initially, <laughs> um, for the past couple of months, it, it sort of looked like there was going to be two groups of championship second tier teams, um, an American and a Patriot division, as it were, up there in the Northeast. Uh, but it looks more, you know, as the, the, the weeks have gone on, that they're going to just have the two tier setup, just a, a pro premier and a single championship and keep it that way for this season. But, you know, the, that second tier has yet to begin play. So we're kind of still wonder, left wondering, you know, what exactly is happening? You know, what is uh, the the... East Coast director Jim Matanakis, what does he have up his sleeve? What does he have in mind, you know, for, for this season? I know in, in previous conversations that I've had with him, um, he was very keen on the idea of creating a very strong pro premier first division UPSL um, in the Northeast and making that as strong as possible. And then that being able to be the springboard to show people, you know, what's possible with promotion or relegation there in the Northeast. So I know that there's going to be two tiers of play. Will there be two divisions of the second tier? That's looking a little bit less likely, but there will be promotion and relegation there mm -hmm. this, this spring season heading into what will hopefully be a very strong fall season for the Northeast. Well, hopefully they get their act together. Still waiting for some action over there, over in the Northeast. Now making our way over to the Midwest as DeKalb County United getting a 2-1 victory over the FC Diablos in that preseason tune-up. What can we be expecting from the Midwest? Well, also a place that's just about to get cracking um, this season. 
So I think DeKalb County playing a, a preseason friendly against FC Diablos, another new UPSL team, will so, sort of start to get the ball rolling there. And it should be a fun season for the Midwest. I think all eyes, of course, will be on Bavarian, the, the reigning champions. Um, and, of course, in their 90th year, they have a, a bunch of celebra celebratory things going on there uh, that we've talked about before. Um, but there is, you know, 24, 25 other teams in the Midwest, all with their own storylines this season. I think just this one is just the beginning of some, of some really special things that are going to happen there in the Midwest this season. This will be one of the most anticipated seasons um, for lower division soccer in the Midwest. And ever since the, um, the, the Great Lakes Premier League sort of joined the UPSL, um, this is sort of the momentum and the moment that a lot of people have been waiting for, this you know, full-fledged, ready-for-the-next-step kind of um, scenario for the Midwest team. So it, it, there's a lot of anticipation for the Midwest this season, and hopefully you know, it really shows with the quality on my Cujo. I think all the teams in the Midwest are pretty much locked in um, for my Cujo this season, so it's going to be available to watch, and everybody's going to get a chance to see it. So can they get 2,000 views as well? Uh, you know... Judging so far by you know viewership across the country so far, you would think PSL is like an outlier. You know maybe they're you know doing something like we said you know that's different or special. But I, you know there are teams in the Midwest with massive historical followings, so I would not be surprised at all to see teams definitely crack 2,000 for for game days and and even push that number. You know I wouldn't be surprised to see Bavarian in the heat of you know, the summer when things are really getting interesting for them to start pulling in, you know, a, a severe and, you know, really important national audience into their games and pushing, you know, even the, the UPSL record for my Cujo views potentially. They have that kind of following. So the, the, pet, the potential is there, I think. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that potential can be able to help them out as far as viewership. But now final stop over into the Central as the San Antonio Runners getting a 3-3 three to -three draw against the FC Waco in the goal in the 90th minute. How big was this goal there? Tying it all up and avoiding mm -hmm. a loss here mm -hmm. in this one. Better a draw than a loss, right? Well, of course, you always want to try and take a, a, at least a point from every match. Um, but Reese Woolley comes up with a, with a hat trick in this game, scores his third goal in the 90th minute to keep this game knotted at a draw. And these two teams, FC Waco and San Antonio Runners, right there at the top of the heart division. They're tied, um, at, I think, 3-0-1 oh, with that draw each apiece. So uh, right there, and I think that's the kind of... Um, competition and, and look that the league is going for that we want you know teams battling at the top and battling at the bottom too but you know to see this kind of you know back and forth game at the top really speaks volumes for the for the level there in the heart division which is you know one of if not the most competitive divisions in the texas central division central conference so um to see this kind of result this early in the season means teams are you know ready for it they want the they want these kind of level of matches this early in the season and the players are performing well so it's a, it's an awesome sight to see yeah texas has a lot of talent over there a lot of talented teams a lot of talented players and some big things coming their way as that'll be the end of the upsl east coast swing tune but coming up next we'll say what's up to the upsl west side Welcome back to Inside the UPSL, presented by TV Emacs. As we say, what's up to the UPSL West Side as we check out what's cracking on the UPSL West Side. First stop, we have the Southwest as the FC Grande has its preseason family at Albuquerque Soul FC postponed. Is this ever going to be rescheduled or is this going to be it? Well, the, the Soul president came on Twitter and said it was unforeseen circumstances. Um, and so who know, really knows what that means, but they're really both teams are super close to the start of their season And so I can't imagine them fitting this in you know in any sort of reasonable schedule and it's unfortunate I mean to be able to play a USL team um, For a UPSL club is a big deal um, It's you're jumping up a couple of levels to try and take on you know quite a big difference in competition And it would mean a lot to their program to be able to achieve this and to, to have you know it canceled on Twitter is a probably a big bummer for FC Grande and the Las Cruces community and their fans. 
um, and all the people that put in the hard work to try and make that happen. So, you know, how do they how do they replace that experience? They really don't. They kind of just have to get up the next morning and move on and say, you know, what we tried, we almost made it happen. Maybe next time or maybe next year. Um, and it's just kind of a, you know, to, to be able to build towards something and, and kind of create that opportunity for the players and then have to go to everybody and say, hey, sorry, it's not going to happen. We really don't know why. It kind of, you know, leaves a kind of a bitter taste, I would think, in everybody's mouth a little bit. So it is a big bummer. A big bummer indeed there, but speaking of bummers, as we shift over to the mountain region, San Juan continuing to get the better end of, of Boise FC with another victory, 5-3. to three. Does this ultimately say the statement and say we're the best team, we're San Juan, and we're the better team here? Oh, man, region? you know, this is a, a back-and-forth rivalry that's gone on now for, you know, 12 months at least between San Juan and Boise, and you know, to have this first game end San Juan's way again, I think it only speaks to San Juan's level at the moment, the quality of players that they're bringing in, and the fact that they're kind of in Boise's head a little bit, maybe. So this matchup always brings a ton of goals. I mean, this game's brought about like 3-2 victories, 5-4 victories. This one, I think, was 5-3 in favor of San Juan. And when they play indoors, especially, it seems like the, the goals just rack up. You know, when they play at San Juan's facility, there's just a, a ton of goals happening. So, you know, especially when they play in Salt Lake City, when they play San Juan, it seems like San Juan for sure is the, the favorite. They take it to Boise and they play at that facility at Boise State, clearly a little more even, um, and Tyson Fox and Boise FC, the cutthroats, a little more comfortable, you know, in their own facility. So things might change a little bit when they get back to Boise. But for now, San Juan is the class of the, the, mountain, the mountain conference right now. And, you know, rivalries are already pretty sweet in sports, so nice things there are going on as far as rivalry is concerned. At least a peaceful rivalry going on. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go that <laughs> far, but yeah, it is a rivalry. So now let's go to where it's a little chillier as far as the mm -hmm. spring season is coming on. And we're going to move over to the Pacific Northwest as... How would the addition of two teams change things up there in the UPSL at uh, Alaska? In the newly newly christened last frontier division of the Pacific Northwest Conference, um, I think right now Alaska, I know right now Alaska is only four teams. And so that's going to create a schedule where these teams are probably playing each other three times this season. Um, how would adding an additional two teams change that? Well, you get to six teams, and then you have five and five. So you can play a full 10-game schedule and play both home and road, and it really evens everything out for everybody. You sort of can visualize the, the schedule and see how it goes. So I think once Alaska and the Last Frontier Division adds that those second two teams and gets to six, and, and then it'll be a stable, a real stable thing. Four teams... Can be a little tenuous because uh, when you only have you know three games uh, games against three other teams those games become heated very quickly you, you see those teams a, the second time that season and then the third time this season and you guys already are building grudges which might be good for the fans and sort of the entertainment value but in terms of being a player in that league having to watch your back all the time because you're playing these guys all the time it can be a little tenuous so i think you know it, it does a lot for a division to try and get the six teams it's, like i said it spreads things out it creates a, a little bit better of a schedule situation so what is the earliest that we can expect a first game up there in alaska i believe the first game is scheduled for june 7th uh, they're going to play a summer schedule they can't play now, there are some indoor facilities in alaska that i'm aware of um, but they want to try and make this an outdoor event for this season in alaska so in june 7th is arctic north versus uh, the rush alaska rush and so you know that that'll be the the first game of what is hopefully a, a, a beautiful thing there in alaska you know a full sprouting of uh pro development soccer there mm -hmm. now players are going to want to play some indoors and want to bump up the heat definitely and they're getting a little tired of the cold up there in I'm alaska sure, I'm sure but now let's move to where it's definitely much warmer over in norcal as the afc heart san francisco traveling over to contra costa fc for a marquee matchup 
Can the Hearts steal the three points that they're missing? Potentially. Contra Costa hasn't played in a couple weeks. They might be a little rusty. They had some uh, Liga NorCal uh, stuff going on this past week. So, you know, who knows what kind of game shape Contra Costa is in. Uh, AFC Hearts, they're on the come up in, in, the, in the, the Wild West. Uh, and they're really looking at this game as a potential, um, you know, game changer for them. Um, I think AFC Hearts is wanting very badly to do well this season. They struggled a little bit in their first season, and I think they, they have some better pieces in place this season. So they look at this game against Contra Costa as a, um, you know, a milestone, perhaps, game, you know, to at least a, a gauging game for them to see where they are. Because Contra Costa has clearly proven to, to everybody in the UPSL already by their performances so far that they're probably the team to beat there. Mm -hmm. So if AFC Hearts can pull, you know, three points in that game, it'll put them in a much better situation going forward, of course, and sort of give everybody a look at Contra Costa and say, hey, maybe they are beatable. Maybe they're not this juggernaut that's come in all of a sudden to, to destroy everybody, right? So um, I think it's up to AFC Hearts to prove that they're up to the, up for the challenge. So do you see this game as a little bit as a statement maker for the AFC Hearts? It could be. It could be. I mean, they're going into Contra Costa's home stadium um, to play this game. So to play well there will be difficult, but I think it's achievable. Um, they got a good squad. They have good management. Uh, they're going to travel well. I know they have a, a decent following there. They're growing their, um, their supporter group there in San Francisco. So it's not a far game from them. They should travel well. It should be a, a good game for them. So there you have it, guys. Anybody that's in NorCal, make sure to travel with the AFC Hearts there and support for your team there. But now, final stop, let's shift our way a little more down south, more to SoCal, as we got some news going up there. As Do you think the north-south model, should that come to an end, or do you think they should do more of the four-division deal? Well, we saw this question on Twitter this week. Um, there are 52 teams playing here in SoCal this spring season. And so it sort of creates a scenario where what's the best format for those teams to play in. Um, it was suggested that perhaps the UPSL, you know, ditch the sort of north-south SoCal model that currently exists and create four tiers. You know, so there's the Pro Premier, the Championship, the League One, and then a full, an unnamed fourth tier for these teams because I think... People really want to see the, the matchups in SoCal, the Cal FC versus Santa Ana wins game, you know, the, the Newcastle versus LA Wolves and so on and so forth. And you can't really get those until the playoffs potentially. And if not, they'll be a one-off. You know, they'll, they'll match up for one time and that'll be it for the season. So I think, you know, people really want to see the best teams in SoCal playing each other every season. And we're not getting that this season. So, you know, there is an idea out there to, to sort of scrap what's already begun here in SoCal, which is a relatively new idea to begin with, um, this north-south division. It just started this last season as a way to sort of, I don't know if it was a, a way to, to minimize travel for teams so much, because SoCal is a, a really, um, you know, accessible region. You know, it's not far to get to one place to the other, really. And so, why separate them into north and south, I think, is a question in people's minds. But there is just so many teams here that we have to build some sort of situation that's equitable for everybody. So that was the situation that was created. Um, you know, will it get to the point where it is obvious that you need to have, you know, the top tier teams in SoCal, the, the Cal FCs and the, you know, all, so on and so forth playing in that tier. And so it, it sort of builds excitement for the division in the league, maybe. But right now, I think everybody's sort of happy with how the situation is going. I haven't heard, you know, any complaints from the teams about their particular situations in their divisions yet. So I think this is more of a fan-based, supporter-based sort of, you know, idealistic way of looking at the SoCal division and trying to find a way to get those best matchups every season. You know, right now it's just not happening. There's too many teams. It, you know, it, it may come to the point where in the future there is a fourth tier in Southern California. Who knows? Yeah, you know, I'm sure. Yeah, you know, I'm sure it's actually not that far away when you think about it. I mean, the UPSL is growing so fast. It wasn't that long ago that there was only one tier, right? And so you know, now that there's three already, you know, it only makes sense that there potentially be a fourth one at some point. Will we go to a you know strictly pro premier championship level and keep all those teams together that are you know no matter what region of southern california they're in per maybe 
but that's at least not happening this season or next season. That would have to be a, a board-related decision going in for like fall 2020 or spring 2021. Mm -hmm. Why not listen to the people and and get what they want? I mean, the SoCal soccer pretty hot down here, and a lot of talented teams, a lot of talented players down here in SoCal. But that's going to be it for here in, in the UPSL. What's up? But before we, when we come back, we'll go ahead and have our final thoughts and our final goodbyes. Don't forget to follow us on all of our social media platforms on Instagram, Facebook, and on Twitter. That is at UPSL Soccer. Welcome back to Inside the UPSL, presented by TV Emacs. Fans, we invite you all to leave your comments below, and we'll select very few questions, and we'll answer them in, after every episode. As we did have a question presented to us last week, we're going to go ahead and give it our best shot to answer it. Question is for you, Dennis, it is, what is the difference between League One in Texas compared to League One in California and Florida? Well, technically, there is no League One in Florida yet. Um, so the differences between the SoCal League One and the Texas League One, the SoCal League One is actually was a pre-existing league called the Cal Champs League um, that operated in the Valley area of Los Angeles. Um, and it was a pre-existing men's league that affiliated with the UPSL. And the idea is their champion will get the opportunity to be promoted into the UPSL championship Granted, they meet certain league minimum standards. You know, they're able to find a place to play that fits the standard of the league and so on and so forth. In, in Texas, um, that's a full-fledged uh, third tier. Um, teams will be promoted into the north, uh, we'll call it the Central Conference North Division, right? They have three tiers there. Um, so the championship of League One will be promoted to the championship division and the bottom team in the championship tier will be relegated to, to League One. So there is real a real thing happening there in Texas, and that's all been created there by Matt Kala and his colleagues in Texas. So, you know, it's a little bit different there in Texas. They have a real setup, you know, a, a pro premier, a championship, and a League One, and it all, you know, runs through promotion relegation. Here in Southern California, the championship tier won't, the bottom teams won't relegate to the the Cal Champs Division League One here. That's just not a setup that's been created. So there isn't full promotion relegation here in Southern California. There's promotion. There's not exactly relegation, really. But there is full promotion relegation in Texas. And I guess that is the key difference. And then, of course, in Florida, it's just the two tiers now. And it's only in Central Florida um, where they have the, the championship tier and the pro premier tier. So the only two places that have three tiers are, are SoCal and Texas. And only Texas has full promotion relegation between the tiers. Mm -hmm. Well, we hope that we were able to answer that question. Again, you can leave your comments below on every video that you guys see, and we will go ahead and select a very few before the show ends on our final thoughts. And don't forget to leave the comments. But we thank you so much for joining us tonight. We thank Eric Gonzalez for joining us tonight. And as always, we thank Dennis Pope for being with us tonight. I was your host, Alex Naveja. Hope to see you guys next week. Have a good night, everybody.